clearly a central bank critic, and he always has a lot to say, uh, and likely has a lot to say about all this rubber band scratching. Mark Faber, author of the Blue, Boo, and Do Report. Great to have you here. On well, this. it's very nice to be in New York, in my great empire. Yeah, because you're coming from Thailand, right? I was just telling yesterday some colleagues of mine at the Baron Brown table that if I would say about China what I'm saying about America, they would let me into the country. But here, when I arrive, the immigration officers they hug me. <laughs> they say, "Welcome <laughs> to, your, to the United States." Me and everyone, and else we don't need to check you. We trust you. <laughs> yeah, we don't need democracy. to go through security. But you said a lot of stuff, um, and we want to get into some of the new things that you're saying right now. We're just talking about, yeah. you know, how how far can this rubber band, so to speak, be really stretched? In other words. At what point do we hit the law of diminishing returns? We get a Fed that's been so accommodative. Um, when does it backfire? Well, we have to distinguish between the financial economy, the financial sector, and the economy of the wealthy people that benefit from rising asset prices, from rising prices of wines and paintings and art and bonds and equities and high-end properties in the Hamptons and uh, West uh, 15 here in New York and so forth. And uh, the average person, the typical household, the so-called median household, or the working class people. And the Fed's policies have actually led to a lot of problems around the world in the sense that they're not only responsible, but partly responsible that energy prices are where they are. They're up from $10, uh, $12 in uh, 1999 to now around $100 a barrel. And uh, food prices are up and a lot of other prices are up. So on your income, energy prices have very little impact because you at Bloomberg, as you young man, you make so much money. But so for the poor people, it has an impact. Uh, some people in the lower income groups, they spend, say, 30% of their income on energy, transportation, and towards electricity, and gasoline. So the Fed is creating a two-class system? Correct. Largely. And the problem is then that and you have energy. people like Bill de Blasio, they come in and say, you know what's the problem? All these rich guys. Because of these rich people, you are poor. They take advantage of you. So let's go and tax them. And the IMF has come out with a paper in Europe that essentially the well-to-do people uh, should pay a 10% wealth tax, a one-time wealth tax. But I can assure you, one-time wealth tax, 10%, will become a every year's tax. <laughs> Eventually. But from the point of view of the government, I mean, what low rates in theory should help people who need to borrow or put kids through college. I mean, how do you help How do you help? How do you help the people on the lower end? Well, this is the point I'd like to make. All these professors and academics at the Fed who never really worked in the private sector a single day in their lives and write papers nobody reads and nobody's interested in, why would they want not write about how do you structure an economic system that lifts the standards of living of most people? You can't live you don't everybody. think we have that, Mark? Well, we had it in the 19th century in the U.S. because we had very small government at the time. The entire government, local, state, uh, federal, was less than 20% of the economy. Now it's like close to 50% of so the government. not spending too much money. The larger the government becomes, the less economic growth you have and the more crony capitalism and corruption you have. Because big corporations, and especially the money printers, they're the most powerful people in the world. They control the government. The U.S. Treasury, uh, the Federal Reserve, and the government is one and the same. The Fed, they finance the Treasury. So the government can go to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Then they tra finance transfer payments to essentially by vote, so you can get elected. So let me just ask you, because we've done a lot of reporting here on Bitcoin, uh, on Bloomberg TV. Yes. 
Given what you just said, what do you think of Bitcoin? I prefer physical gold and silver platinum uh, to Bitcoin. Bitcoin can have a lot of competition. Gold and silver and platinum, they have no competition. They've got Bitcoin. Well, they have Bitcoins, but how do you value a Bitcoin? I can value gold to some extent and compare, say, gold to the quantity of money that is floating around the world, to the wealth increase, and to the monetary base increase, to the credit increase, and so forth, and so on. To have a fair, and to the production cost, to have a, a, an idea where gold should be. I'm not sure, because price is overshoot. How do you value Netflix? Is it overpriced or underpriced? Is Tesla overpriced or underpriced? But one thing I wanted to show you uh, and talk about, because you said, well, lower interest rates help people. Well, if money printing helps everybody, then why does not everybody in the whole world always have zero interest rates and everybody would be rich? Well, and you keep on printing money and we all, you don't need to work here, and you don't need to put on makeup and I can stay in bed the whole day until I go drinking in the evening. So let's just print money. And be all happy. Well, I tell you, what, I mean, it doesn't add up. You understand? Yeah. And one thing about what the figures you show, first of all, you live in New York. Yeah. Do you really think that your cost of living increase is a 1.2 percent per annum? Do you really believe that? It feels like more. Well, it doesn't feel like more. It feels like five times more, precisely, or even ten times more. That's what it feels. Number two. By keeping interest rates at 0% on the Fed fund rate, and I want to emphasize that this is now going on in March of 2014 for five years. So it's not something new. For five years this has happened. You penalize the income earners, the yes. savers who save your parents. Yes. Why, do, why do you, should your parents be forced to speculate in stocks and in real estate and in everything under the sun. When we the should minimum be one is, is, is return for bonds. We've got to take a very quick break, Mark. Yes, uh, we are glad it's you're here. It's very sad. Part. The break. We're talking about uh, income and disparity and specifically uh, what you want to us short right now. What you don't we are here with legendary investor Mark Robert. And we're talking about stocks that are overvalued um, on your list. Facebook, Tesla, Twitter, Netflix, Viva. I can understand Tesla and Twitter, right? I mean, they're not even earnings on Twitter. Um, why Facebook? Well, I think it's to a large extent the bad, and you know, people they go on Facebook. It's uh, for most people, what people do is they put the pictures on, and the only people that watch these pictures are themselves. They all want to be stars. It's a very distractive kind of occupation. I I can't imagine that this would have a lot of value. So, yeah, yeah, I, look, I, I'm not I sure. I think it. So people are going on and regardless, they're going and looking at their own pictures, their friends' pictures. <laughs> but Facebook can appeal to them through an advertising campaign. Yeah, right. be it's very eyeballs. direct. You know, yeah. yeah, right. What's wrong with eyeballs? Yeah, yeah. sure, look, it can be. The question is of how much use it is. I would rather own. I don't own it because I think it's uh, very highly priced, but I would rather own company like Alibaba or Amazon or Google than Facebook personally. But this is my view. Other people have different views. You That's what the makes the market. Well. Some people are buying it and some people are selling it. You, you, you know, you, you, you named a number of stocks, but when you look at the market valuations overall, do you have some concerns? Do you, do you worry when the Fed steps back? I think we are in a gigantic financial asset bubble. But it's interesting that Despite of all the money printing, bond yields didn't go down. They bottomed out on July 25, 2012, at 1.43% of the 10 year. We're now, we went to over 3%. We're now at 2.85% of the but top still there about, from your view. But we're up substantially. Now, this hasn't had an impact on stocks yet. In fact, it pushed money into the stock market out of the bond market. But if the 10 years goes to say three and a half to four percent, then the 30 year goes to close to five percent, the mortgage rates go to six percent, 
that relates to the economy very hard. And that's when the bubble bursts. The ninth world, it can burst before, it can burst any day. I think we're very strange. Sentiment figures are very, very bullish. Everybody's bullish. And the reality is that they're very bullish because they think the economy will accelerate on the upside. But my view is very different. The global economy is slowing down. The global economy is largely emerging economies nowadays. They're slowing down. There's no growth at the moment in exports in emerging economies. There's no growth in the, the local economies. So I feel that the valuations are high. The corporate profits have been boosted largely because of the fall in interest rate. That is one of the reasons why you are long gold, Mark Robert. I wish we could keep this going. <laughs> yes, I Thank wish so. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much.